Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the IDF Forum, How to Thrive and Survive in an Emergency. My name is Colleen Brock, and I am the Manager of Medical Programs at IDF. On behalf of the Immune Deficiency Foundation, welcome. Whether this is the first time you have joined us this evening, or if you are a returning member of the community, we are so excited to have you here this evening. Before we begin a quick disclaimer, although tonight's forum will not include medical advice and medical questions will not be addressed tonight, please remember that the information presented during IDF forums are not medical advice and nor it is intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Always seek the advice of a physician or other qualified healthcare provider with questions concerning your medical condition. IDF's mission, it is to improve the diagnosis, treatment, and quality of life of people affected by primary immunodeficiency through fostering a community empowered by advocacy, education, and research. IDF's vision, it is by offering these tools and resources that IDF can fulfill its vision of seeking to ensure that everyone in the US affected by PI has a fully informed understanding of the PI diagnosis that affects them, all available treatment options, the expected standard of care, all of their opportunities for connection and support within the PI community. IDF forums are made possible by our wonderful sponsors. It is due to their partnerships and contributions that IDF is able to provide programs such as this one and services to everyone in the PI community. Thank you to our 2021 sponsors, CSL Bearing, Griffles, Takeda, Horizon, Octopharma, Acredo, ADMA Biologics, BPL Bioproducts Laboratory, Farming, Farm X4 Pharmaceuticals, Kedrion Biopharma, and Saleo Health. So we have a lot of upcoming events. Even though the holidays are coming, IDF is busy too. IDF Get Connected groups provide an opportunity for individuals in the PI community to meet virtually in a small group setting. They're held nationwide throughout the year and a great way to meet others. IDF forums that are coming up. What's special about a specialty pharmacy? That's going to be held November 18th. COVID-19, what we know now. And as you know, there are lots of new things that have come out. That will be held on December 7th. The Zebra Strong series, How to Thrive and Survive in an Emergency, part two and three, will be held on December 9th and December 16th. All of those are on the calendar of events on the IDF website, primaryimmune.org backslash events to register. They are all open. The Walk for PI season is still going strong. Registration is free and can be completed at www.walkforpi.org. Walk for PI is a season long initiative of IDF dedicated to making a difference for everyone in the community. Please join us as we raise funds, walk with friends and family and achieve fundraising rewards. For example, everyone who raises $25 will receive an IDF Walk for PI shirt. If you have questions regarding a walk, you may email walk at primaryimmune.org. So now for our feature presentation, I would like to welcome and introduce our presenter, Heidi Rosowski. Heidi has been involved in building community resilience in the face of emergencies for more than 40 years. In the early 1980s, after receiving a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, Heidi turned her focus to planning for community members who may need assistance preparing for emergencies, acting upon emergency instructions, and dealing with the aftermath of disasters. She officially joined the zebra herd in 2013 when she learned that she had CVID. Ms. Rosowski is the Senior Emergency Management Consultant for Inclusive Planning at Global Visions Consortium, a member of her County Disabilities Access and Functional Needs Working Group and Operational Area Exercise Design Committee, the National Coordinator for the Abilities Expo Emergency Preparedness Initiative a member of Earthquake Country Alliance Great Shakeout Accessibility ECA Committee, and a co-chairperson for our ECA Southern California region. Ms. Rosowski, you certainly have a lot of knowledge to share with us this evening, and I look forward to hearing everything you have to say. 
So with that, I will let you present. Thank you very much. And I'm really, really happy to be here. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And I got into this particularly with the, um, the focus on people who have needs beyond the, the average of just shelter uh, and so forth, uh, because it, it was important to me personally. And with that, this, this series is three parts. We're gonna be discussing uh, the first part of, the, of this series. So this first part of the series, we're gonna be talking about why do you need to prepare? And we're gonna be looking at it predominantly from a catastrophic viewpoint, but if you're prepared for a catastrophic event, you can handle the smaller ones with uh, um, a better understanding of what you need to do. We're gonna be discussing the disaster impacts, the things you need to think about and plan for, personalizing your planning for you and your family, and understanding what are safe spaces in different disasters and creating safe space if you need to, uh, in order to make, make sure that you are not uh, injured or, uh, or at least reducing your chance of injury or death because of the disaster. Um, any questions that you have, please submit to the chat and we will get to them later. The other two sessions, one is December 9th and, the other, and December 16th, the December 9th one will be really talking and focusing on disaster kits from what we call shelter in place kits, which is the bigger kit that kind of has everything you need to what we call go kits, which is something you can grab and go when you don't have much time to gather anything up. Putting together a personal support team, which is really critical to making sure that you can have the help you need when you need it. And evacuation planning, whether it's from what do you do in a house fire to get out and reunify with your family to more catastrophic events. And then on the, the third uh, session, we're going to be talking about reconnecting with, uh, um, with your resources like home health providers, what to expect from local emergency management, and the importance of personal and community advocacy. So why prepare? Well, we've seen a lot of disasters happening in, in, this, in the last couple of years, whether it's a hurricane or an earthquake or a tornado or a storm or a flood, we've been seeing them across the country in increasing uh, tendencies. So they can occur at any time and we really need to start preparing now and remain prepared. We need to prepare, the need to prepare per, applies from the smaller disasters all the way through multi-regional events. And the main difference between the smaller ones and the larger ones is really the scale and impact on community resources. The larger the disaster, the less of your usual resources will be available to you and the more you will need to be able to meet your needs on your own. First responders may not be immediately available, and this is particularly true in large scale disasters. I live in earthquake country. What's going to happen after a major earthquake is the fire department does what they call a, a windshield survey, where they kind of go around and they get an idea of what the size and scope of the disaster is. They're not stopping, no matter what your emergency is, whether your house is on fire, whether someone is injured or something, they have larger uh, missions that they have to to deal with rather than just what's happening in your home situation. So your first responders are really going to be your neighbors versus the typical first responder community. The key to surviving and thriving is the more you are prepared, the more you can manage your own needs and the more secure you can be that you and your family can not just survive but thrive in, in the case of a disaster. And in, in some cases, some of the information that, that uh, you're going to hear and particularly being prepared can really save your life. For instance, evacuating from a single family fire. So this is something that is not overwhelming and can be done in bite by bite ways. And, and it doesn't have to be financially unfeasible either. There are ways to break things down to make sure that you can start to prepare and be prepared for whatever kinds of disasters occur in your area. So if you're prepared for the catastrophic disaster, you are definitely prepared for the smaller events. 
the first thing that you have to do to really understand what you need to prepare for is understanding what are the disaster impacts. Phones, water, electricity, gas, none of that may be working. Roads may be impassable, whether it's from an earthquake or a flood or a tornado. Transportation resources may not be operating. So if you are someone who uses public transportation, understand that those resources may not be operating or will be tasked to the emergency and won't be operating in individual neighborhoods. Grocery stores, pharmacies, banks may all be closed. Gas stations, if the power is out, won't be able to pump gas because the pumps have to use electricity to be able to do that. Hospitals may be overwhelmed with the injured and really only taking and dealing with people who are who, who are need assistance right away and are more critical. Getting accurate information may be difficult, particularly when phone and cell phone lines are, are uh, overwhelmed or, or not working. So you really need to be able to meet your own needs. They used to say, meet your own needs for three days. We've subsequently learned that three days is not necessarily enough. So you need to be prepared for more like a week to be able to manage at home. And if you are in a situation like in earthquake country here, where it may be even more difficult to get supplies in, it may need to be longer than that. And that kind of information you can discuss with your local Red Cross or your local emergency management or any other group that is involved in disaster preparedness and planning. The key to personalized planning is to make sure that it meets the needs of you and your family members. And you need to make a plan for wherever you spend a lot of time. So at work, you need to have a plan for work and a plan at home. You, at work, you want to make sure that you talk with your uh, supervisors on, do they have a plan? And if they don't have a plan, advocate for putting one together. If you spend time over at another family members or friends or volunteering, wherever you spend a lot of time, school, find out what the school plan is. That's where you need to make sure that your plan dovetails with whatever plans are available or have been prepared wherever you may spend a lot of time. And then you need to assess your own personal situation. What are your needs? They may be different than someone down the street from you or someone that you're working with. So you really need to look at what kinds of resources do I use on a daily basis? And what kind of what can I do to meet my needs if those resources are not available to me in the midst of a disaster? You need to address the concerns that are for you and for your family. Uh, for those of you who have children with uh, um, primary immune deficiency, understanding what the plans are that your child may need or how, what resources you need to be, be sure you can reconnect with is a part of that personal disaster plan for your family. As you're creating a plan, share it with close friends and family members, get their input, take a look at what's available from groups like Red Cross and the emergency management in your local area, federal emergency management agency, State and local governments have a lot of information on preparing. Prepare for the work, worst case situation. So the biggest scale disaster likely to hit your area because if you are prepared for that, you're gonna be able to manage the smaller ones and practice your plan. In my area, because it's earthquake country out here in California, when the clocks change, my family, resupplies our disaster kit. We rotate supplies. We may even make a dinner out of those supplies using the, our propane stove or something that we would use because electricity is not available. So there's a way to practice and prepare for your worst case scenario and a way to make it so it's not threatening or overwhelming for you or your children or any other family member. So assessing your, your situation, 
one of the biggest questions that people have and they need to, to think about is how do I, or does all my family reunify and get back together if we aren't at home? If someone's at work, how do they get to you? If someone's at school, how do you pick up and what's the plan for reuniting students with parents? If you have to evacuate and you don't have personal transportation or roads are impassable, how are you going to do that? Uh, how do I you communicate with loved ones? How do I charge power dependent equipment? Those are all things that you need to be thinking about and planning for. And the answers for how you do that are going to change depending on what your situation is. For instance, communicating with loved ones, cell towers may not be uh, working to top efficiency, some may be down, voice communication via cell may not be possible, but text may be able to get through. Uh, if you have the ability, if there's any internet available or anything like that, if you can get online, uh, you may be able to post something like Red Cross, Cross has a, has a uh, uh, website called Safe and Well, where you can post that you are okay. So your family members can check that and make and know that you have survived and that you are, are uh, doing okay. Uh, there's also, you can use the social media to be able to communicate with family members. We've seen that uh, as a growing resource in disasters across the nation. Obviously in the catastrophic ones, it may be more difficult or impossible to communicate, but the usual ones that are, um, that hit communities, there's usually some communication that, that is available whether, whether or not uh, all resources are, are available. Charging independent power equipment. What does that mean? What do you have to charge? Uh, do you, are you looking at a generator? Are you looking at um, just the, the way to charge your cell phone? What are the kinds of things that you need to look at? Do you, if, if you use, bat, if the equipment use batteries, do you have batteries for battery backup so that you can change batteries? Those are the kinds of things that you need to look at and talk about and find the solution that works for you and your family. For all of us, assessing our situation also includes, what do I do about reconnecting so I can get my IVIG infusion? How do I get my supplies? What is the home health care company's emergency plan? I have to tell you from my own experience, when I have pushed on my home health agency about it, I keep being told, yeah, we have a plan, but I've yet to see it. And so it's something that I am concerned about. And it's one of the things that we as a community can advocate for making sure that we understand what that home health care company's plan is. What if I'm not at home? If my house is, has been damaged that I can't stay in it, how do I get my supplies? How do I let the home health care company know that I'm in a shelter or I'm at another family members to be able to, to be sure that your treatment can be ongoing? For those who are getting IV infusions, what about a nurse being able to come out? You know, what is the plan for that? If they cannot necessarily get to you. Are they going to set something up where you can get to them? Uh, talk to your doctor about whether or not, you know, you can't, you know, what if, if an emergency occurs, what are the limits in terms of when you have to have treatment? Can you stretch it out one? Should you stretch it out one? And the answer may be yes or no, depending on what your condition is. But have a conversation about what are the things that you need to prioritize should a disaster occur to make sure that your health remains in as good a state as possible under a very stressful situation? Again, some of the pumps require power dependent equipment, but a lot of them you run off batteries. So talk to your home health agency about having extra batteries if they supply them for you so that should something occur, you have that available for you. Uh, what other kinds of assistance do you and your family regularly use? Uh, do you use uh, transportation to and from a, an infusion center? Or, um, you know, what are the needs that you have that you use on a regular basis? Is there uh, someone that comes to the home that helps 
you are a family member. What's the plan for dealing with that if that person cannot get to you? Depends on, again, whether you're talking something that's more like PT, OT, uh, someone who comes out and assists you with, with uh, home health care in terms of making meals and things like that. So you need to find out what it is when you look at what you need, what it is you need to do to make sure that that you have that assistance when you need it. And it may come from sources that you may not originally have thought about. If someone cannot get to you, such as a, someone who does like uh, helps you with meal, meals or, or cleaning your house and laundry or so forth, if they can't get to you, maybe it's something that you talk to your close neighbors, the, the ones that could get to you by walking uh, about whether or not they can help you and what it is that you need to tell them about how best to help you. That's a topic we'll be talking about uh, in the, uh, the second session on personal support teams. And again, how do you receive this assistance? Is it coming out of something like uh, in-home supportive services? Is it coming out of a private care agency? Uh, is it someone that you pay to come into the home? Find out and look at all of those situations. Now, as far as safe spaces are concerned, we're talking about when a disaster occurs, understanding disaster specific safety actions. Where do you go in a tornado? If you have a, a basement, can you get into the basement for it? Can you get into the bathroom? What do you need to bring in there with you? How do you make the, safest, the space as safe as possible so that things will not fall on you and potentially injure you? And you need to make sure that you understand what to do and how to create safe space, again, wherever you spend a lot of time. So if you're in an office setting and you are in earthquake country, are the things in your office secured to the walls so they're not likely to fall on you and create injury? Do you know how to drop cover and hold on in the event of an earthquake? If you may need assistance getting up out, of, out from under a desk or chair, who's going to help you with that? If you are a wheelchair user or a walker user and you may not be able to get down and underneath the chair, what is it that you need to do to adapt that safety action for you? As far as earthquakes are concerned, Earthquake Country Alliance has a wonderful, wonderful website that can give you all of that kind of information and help you on what to do to create safe space. Uh, a lot of wind-driven types of disasters, um, tornadoes and so forth, you know, the, there are things that, although your house may not blow apart, the shaking from the winds may make things fall and break. So what can you do to ensure that that doesn't happen? And that's our things like um, using latches on the cabinet so things don't fall out, making sure that, um, that uh, things don't fall off a shelf and, and hurt you. So one of the things you have to look at, for instance, is if you have a lot of things around your bed, and particularly if you have something that is, oh, that's likely to fall and hit you if you're in bed, make sure that you move that so that you create a safe space that if something occurs while you're in bed, that, that it's not likely to injure you. A lot of what you need to do to create space, safe spaces will depend on what kind of disaster that you are, you're the area that you are in has. When as far as floods are concerned, what we've seen a lot of is people who choose not to evacuate, which is not recommended. Um, oftentimes they'll go to a second story or up into an attic. If you're gonna do something like that, and particularly with the attic, make sure that you have tools up there that can help you cut through the attic so that you don't get stranded if the water levels rise that far. But again, we're recommending that when an evacuation order comes down that you evacuate. And even when it's a voluntary evacuation, you might wanna consider making sure you have all your stuff ready to go and go in that first wave to whether it's a shelter or a neighbor or friends, maybe not a neighbor, but friend or family member that are likely to be outside the disaster area. 
Again, secure anything that could move, fall, break, or cause injury. And you wanna keep pathways clear of anything that could impede your ability to get out of the house. And this is something that we're talking about even in a single family fire. You wanna make sure that hallways and areas and how you get out don't have a lot of clutter so that you can use them to leave the home if you need to. In order to survive and thrive in a disaster, you really need to prepare for disaster by understanding their impacts on you and on your community. You need to make a plan that accounts for all of your needs. You need to practice that plan and you need to share preparedness information with neighbors and friends. One of the things that, again, we said, I said earlier, is that some of your first responders may need, be your neighbors. So if you need help, if there's an injury, particularly something that requires first aid, it may be your neighbors that will be the ones that will be helping you first. So sharing preparedness information with neighbors and family members help you all become more likely to survive and thrive when a disaster occurs. Now, this session has been really more about kind of giving you an idea of, kind of the things that you need to start looking at and the things that you need to start planning for. In the other two sessions, we'll be getting into the nitty gritty of things like kits and evacuations and things like that. But right now, what you can do is start that personal assessment where you can take a look at what are the things that are critical for me? What do I need? Medications, your, your supplies, if you keep some of your, um, your, your supplies at home, particularly for those who are uh, doing sub Q, you know, what, make sure that they're packed together where you can grab and go if you need to. So take a look at what are your individual needs based on where you live, the disasters that are likely in your area, you can contact your local emergency management office, which is a city or county office, and they can give you a lot of information on the disasters that are likely to affect your area. Uh, and then also they'll have a lot of preparedness information as well. I sit on a committee with my local uh, county emergency management for people who have needs beyond uh, shelter and, uh, and, and so forth that we take a look at what are the needs that people who have disabilities or medical issues would need that they may not be able to access if they have to leave their homes. So getting involved in, in that kind of work and advocacy will also help you plan better and, and help you understand where your community is in terms of the planning that you need for you to be able to ensure that you survive and thrive. And I think we're going to be going to a short break before we, before we start with questions. So Colleen, I'm gonna throw it back to you. Thanks Heidi, I appreciate it a lot. That was a lot of great information. We're going to go back to the Q&A session now and talk with Heidi and answer some of the questions that have come in. One of the questions that I have, Heidi, is can hotels house people with certain health issues for free during emergencies? And if so, how do you find them? Okay. The, there is nothing that says that a hotel has to provide free, free room space. What often happens is that if you are if you need to evacuate, usually the Red Cross or the county or city will set up a shelter. If your medical situation is such that you cannot be housed in a shelter, then one of those uh, may pick up a hotel or, or another uh, means of um, sheltering you. Uh, Red Cross, I know, does this for uh, often. Uh, I was a volunteer. I've been a volunteer for them for for a long, long time. So they have a sheltering program. And one of the things that you want to do, irrespective of whether or not you need sheltering, is if the Red Cross has a shelter open, they may also have a, a 
a registration area where you can go and uh, at least check in with them so that you can find out what the information is about what the county is doing for recovery and so forth. And they have, um, they always have someone, whether it's a nurse or a paramedic or someone in the shelter, that if you have issues and needs in terms of getting some of your supplies, that's who you want to talk to so that they can help you get some of those supplies replaced or medications or so forth if you weren't able to grab them um, or and so forth. So there are resources out there and Red Cross may not be as strong in some parts of the country as others, but someone is responsible for sheltering, whether it's Red Cross or whether it's the county or city. Essentially, the buck stops at the government. So the county or city has the ultimate responsibility for sheltering. So if you're not having your needs met, you need to start with whoever is responsible for the sheltering and start by going to that shelter and finding out um, what they have available. And if it doesn't meet your needs, talk to them about an accommodation. Because under American Disabilities Act, they must find an accommodation for you in, in order to be able to meet the needs that you have. Now, it doesn't have to be a hotel. There are there may be that they have within the shelter a way to set up some rooms that are uh, like classrooms or something that they're using for sheltering, where they are, uh, allow you to be uh, not within the shelter population as a whole, so you have an area where your your um, exposure to the rest of the shelter operate uh, the shelter may be lower. So, first and foremost, you need to let let your needs be known and why you need the accommodation, and and uh, and they will uh, work on that accommodation for you. Thank you. So we've talked about um, people and what to do in an emergency, but what happens to a person's pets? Okay, pets are part of the family too. So you mm -hmm. need to make sure that you have plans. Your, your plans and your kits include your animals. Now, again, in a normal sheltering situation, pets are usually not allowed in shelters, but the local animal control or assist whoever does animal control for your area is responsible for helping to care for animals that have where you've been displaced from your home. So if you can't stay in your home, whether you're staying elsewhere, they are responsible for having a solution to be able to care for your animal. Most of us don't want to be separated from them. Um, so they do tend to set up the, uh, the animal shelters for uh, people who are evacuated or can't go back into their homes. Uh, next to standard shelters. That does not apply to service animals. If you have an, a service animal as defined by the Americans with Disabilities Act, and that definition has changed in the last couple of years, that animal is allowed to accompany you into the shelter and or recovery area. But you are responsible for taking uh, control of the animal and making sure the animal is, is uh, working properly. So one of the things that you may need to think about is making sure that you have animal food, you have an extra leash, you have maybe an extra blanket or toy that the animal likes, some way to crate an animal if it's a cat or something like that, um, so that, that if you have to go that you have their supplies together as well. For a service animal, under, understand that this will happen to both pets and service animals, but less often to service animals. The animals may be upset by whatever the disaster is. We see this a lot with earthquakes. And if it's a service animal, they may not be behaving in the way they normally do. And that's why it's really up to you to be able to make sure that you are uh, managing your service animal. If the animal is becomes a problem because of how stressed they are, then again, some kind of accommodation will be made. Um, wh whether it's the pets, the animal control people will help work with that too. And they do make sure that you can visit your pet and all the rest of it if you cannot keep the pet at home. But their family members, make sure you've got water for them, you got food for them, you got a way to for them to be able to come with you and still be able to be maintained. There's also something called pet first aid. And uh, in my area, the Red Cross has a pet first aid class. 
So you can take something like that even to make sure that you know uh, what what to do is oftentimes um, like in an earthquake or something and there's stuff that breaks on the floor if that animal walks over it they can cut their pads or something on their feet so they may need you know a little first aid too so there are resources that are out there to be able to make sure that you can plan for your pets and there are specific guides that are out there from both FEMA and the state uh, and Red Cross on planning for your pet so you can go to a Red Cross website or your local city or state um, website and look under preparedness or emergency management, and there'll be a lot of information that you can find there on, on not only for your pets, but planning for you and your family as well. Thanks, Heidi. I wish I had known a lot of what you've talked about tonight um, quite a while ago when we went through our disasters. Um, we ended up having to leave our pet locked in the garage for the night because it was the only part of the house that they could stay in. And at that point, they weren't allowed to go with us and the dog was traumatized for the rest of its life. And so I think we've come a long way with understanding that pets are important to people. Well, there are a lot of people that refuse to evacuate if they can't take their pet. We saw that in Hurricane Katrina. Yes. And, um, and the emergency management community really learned from that. Uh, not only that, but like I said, the whoever is responsible for animal control not only has the responsibility for shelter and care of the animals, and it's not like you're putting them in the pound where they have so many days if you have a kill shelter. It's totally separate. It's not like, like you're relinquishing it in any way, shape, or form, so don't be concerned or afraid of that. But they also have a responsibility, as we've seen in some floods, to be able to go out there and retrieve animals who've been left at home who need rescuing themselves. So if you've had to leave and you, particularly cats, when they go somewhere, when, they're, when there's uh, an emergency and you can't find them and you need to leave, we saw this in the fires a lot too, that mm -hmm. there will, once it's safe enough for responders to go out, they will start looking for animals that, um, whose owners may not have been able to take them with and try to reunify them as well. So it's important that you have your animal chipped or you, and you have tags on them and all the rest of it so that they can be reunited with you. That's good information. So another question that we have, in the height of an emergency and, and depending upon what it is, you may only have a few minutes and, and you've got to go. And so if you are in that emergency situation, you're in a shelter, you're at a friend's house now, how do you figure out what insurance you have as far as, you know, confirming that you have coverage for your house or coverage for your car, if it's been a car accident and, and you know, a, a blizzard of some sort and, and things have happened. What do you recommend people do to, for their insurance information so they have it easy to find quickly. And this is really important when it's a larger scale disaster where federal relief is starting to come in as well because there's a lot of documentation that they need. So first off, from what we call the, the shelter at home kit, which is the largest emergency kit, you should keep copies of your documents or put them on a CD or something in that kit. You might wanna keep a, a copy like of a CD or something with a friend or family member who is not within, like if it's a flood, the flood zone, or uh, who may be outside of the disaster area in most of the disasters that could occur in your area. Um, scanning the documents and putting them in the cloud is a great thing because then you can um, start to get them down when you need them for, um, for getting that information keeping a copy of a file offline on your phone that has uh, that information is another way. Putting them on a thumb drive that you might even have on your keychain of your car or, or, uh, so, or your house keys is something else where you can scan. And the, the critical information that you may need is gonna be uh, maybe a rental agreement or um, your insurance information, a copy of your deed for your your house or your car, all of those kinds of important records. And for a list of all of the things that you may want to put in that information kit, 
preparedness kit. Again, Red Cross and FEMA both have uh, some great handouts that you can download on their website. Um, or in the case of local Red Cross, you can contact them regarding getting copies of them if you're not super uh, uh, internet savvy, that you can download and you can take a look at what those documents are that apply to you. One of the important things on top of insurance is that you wanna make sure that you have your medical information, including all your doctors, the medications that you take, who your home health care company is, who your specialty pharmacy is, all of that information is part of that information that needs to go in that kit that you can access should it uh, be necessary. I have a form that I have in my wallet all the time that ha that has everything from my uh, my the people my loved ones to contact, my insurance information for my health insurance, my medical conditions, my allergies and my medications. And I have it it's a two-sided plain sheet of paper printed on both sides. I keep that in my wallet all the time. And I'll tell you it's not just for emergencies when I go to a new doctor I, you know, they never give you enough space to write everything down. So I always put see attached list. And besides, they can't read my writing. It's it's terrible. So um, I mean, even doctors have trouble reading it and their handwriting's awful. So it's something that has an application. And a lot of this has an application whether or not you are uh, in a disaster or not. I did see one one question that came in below that said, what constitutes an emergency? And it's actually a good question. An emergency is anything that is happening to you that you cannot manage on your own, whether it's a single family fire or something like that. The definition of a disaster or emergency as we're talking about it includes things like fires, natural disasters, maybe something like uh, evacuation because of a chemical spill, or uh, it might be, you know, there's a lot of things that come under that. But an emergency is a situation that is occurring to you that you need to have resources beyond what you can manage is the way um, I tend to define it. What we call access and functional needs or individuals who or community members who might need additional assistance uh, we define that, and that's the buzzword that emergency management uses for anybody but an able-bodied individual. And it's we're really talking about anyone who would need some kind of assistance or accommodation to receive or act upon emergency information and recovery re recovery um, directions. So that's essentially what it is. And we always say a disaster is something that happens to everybody else. A catastrophe is when it happens to me. <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> um, so the last question, if you are on equipment that requires power and you are, you're in a situation where there's a power outage, or I'm not sure in California when they have the rolling um, outages, is there not a way that you can contact your power company to tell them that you're a higher priority to get your power back because of the equipment that you need, whether it's a feeding tube, whether it's, you know, your pump for your infusions, whatever, but you need power. You can contact your power company and they do keep a list of that. And what happens is in an emergency, you will get... A, particularly when it comes to like the rolling blackouts because of the fire, you will get notification that that's going to occur so that, and they, they usually give you a time frame so that you know that maybe you need to go to someone's house outside of that rolling blackout area for a while. Um, the power company, because of the way the grid is set up, cannot isolate a single house to provide power. The, the lines that way are not possible. So depending on the kinds of, of, uh, of what you use, you need to make sure that you have non-powered backup. So for the pumps, a lot most of them run on batteries. For something like oxygen, you need to make sure that the company that supplies your oxygen has supplied you with the tanks that you can use. Most people use an oxygen concentrator, which is a powered piece of equipment. Um, for oxygen, but the tanks are for backup. And the oxygen companies 
again, you want to know what their plan is to get the additional tanks out to you should uh, a black uh, should should a, a power outage occur for longer than what those tanks can entail. And you have to make sure you stay on top of if you've used them, making sure they get rotated out so that you suddenly don't turn them on and find they're empty. So it, it's really a connection between you and the resources to be able to get information and then to mitigate it as a part of your plan when it's just something like fires or something. Oh, and if you live a fire in a fire area, a brush fire area, which is happening in California and a lot of areas now, they, a lot of, because of the lawsuits that have occurred uh, toward the power companies, they now shut down power in certain areas that are at risk when there are certain weather conditions that are going to start a fire. And when, and those are in brush fire zones, particularly. Um, and what happens there is the power companies are working to, to be able to get out um, generators or even, even solar power generators and regular generators temporarily out to people who need that power to run power dependent equipment until that weather event um, has passed and they can go back to turning power on. This, because so many of the fires have been thought to have been started by down power lines and they're being held responsible for it, this is what the power companies are doing. So emergency management on the state levels uh, are looking at what can they do to ensure that people who have critical need for power for medical resources primarily um, can't have it and, and have a way to do that. The other possibility is if your power goes out in some of the, the cold weather, they will open warming areas or, or even in the summer uh, cooling areas when the air conditioning um, situation may go down because of rolling power, out, power outages. Listen to your local news stations for where those are located. Some of them, will, uh, your local emergency management will post them on their Twitter pages and Facebook pages and all the rest of that. Uh, some areas will send out texts if you sign up for them where they will get emergency texts. Uh, in our area, we have something now called Shake Alert, which can give you maybe 30 seconds to a minute time before an earthquake is due to hit your area. What happens is it starts and there's a delay in time before it hits areas that are a little further out. So it, it can be 30 seconds up to about a minute, which is enough time to get yourself down and under something and safe. So you need to make sure that you contact your local emergency management and or your Red Cross and find out if those kinds of resources for giving you information about rolling power outages, um, uh, evacuations, uh, things of that order to make sure that you are connected to being able to get that information. Thank you so much, Heidi. You have been, done an amazing presentation and your answers have been very helpful and informative. So I want to thank you for donating and your, you know, volunteering your time that it took to put it all together and for being here tonight. And I look forward to the next two sessions and what I can learn of the from those. So with that, I would like to thank all of our sponsors again this evening, CSL Bearing, Takeda, Octopharma Farming, and X4 Pharmaceuticals for sponsoring tonight's forum and, and for your support of IDF. It means a lot. With that, I want to say thank you. Thank you for uh, putting up with my first time emceeing effort. <laughs> And I hope to see you soon. Remember that we have the ongoing nationwide IDF Tech Connected groups. We have the, the upcoming forums, what's special about a specialty pharmacy, COVID-19, what we know now, and then the other two that belong to this series, Zebra Strong, How to Thrive and Survive in an Emergency. And with that, I'd like to say good night.